Dear Guiv Galeer Accordia August of Road, welcome to be my guest with me, Mary Honan, on Lear Media TV, supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary. And I'm now looking forward to this interview with a man who I interviewed before on radio, um, not on vision. And as you can see, he adds so much to the to the picture here. And that's Kevin Clancy, the founder of Claire's Wish Foundation. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Mary. Good morning. And uh, actually, do you know what I was thinking a while ago? You did my very, very first interview on radio. That's that I did. I, I did because you were you were a newbie at it and you were I, I, you were a bag of nerves before you came out, but you were fabulous uh -huh. on. It was the very, very first interview I ever did on radio. And I think I made the mistake, I don't do it anymore, but I made the mistake of writing three full cap pages down. You just, just it doesn't work like that. It's all, it's all, um, shortly after that, actually, we spoke. I went on to 95 FM and did the same thing. I wrote three full caps pages of stuff. And it's, that that's a no, no because you know sooner trying to read it and you're gone from script and it, it just doesn't work. You, you're oh, as well off. I don't, even, well off. I don't well even write I don't even write questions, Kevin. I just yeah. I, I when I started off I used to have once when I started off in radio I had a load of questions all laid out yeah. and um, <laughs> uh, to ask and then I found that, no, within five minutes, I thought this isn't my style. My style yeah. is more of wanting to know about people's lives and about the journeys that they've gone on. And yeah. you can't do that if you're conscious of the next question. No. And, no. I, and it's what puts me off of certain um, uh, broadcasters and certain hosts. Tommy Tiernan has it down to a T and he oh, seems to do the same kind of a thing as... It, uh, as I like to do, which is to just sit and listen, ask yeah. a question, and your questions will come from what the other person is saying, if you're really Correct, listening. correct. So I was sat in front of Joe on 95 FM, the very first radio interview, and I was, again, I was a bag of nerves. <laughs> and I had three full cats pages, and within three minutes, he went on the tangent of, uh, he picked up the Claire Clancy, my sister, had spina bifida. And he started asking me questions about the spine of Bifford. And so I was right when I said to, yeah. Re to Red Harley that she had, sp that Claire had spine of Bifford. Bifford. But yeah. Joe started asking me questions about spine of Bifford that I did. I, I'm not a, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't have the knowledge on spine of Bifford. So I was blown out of track completely with, with the interview. So, but I had a look, you learn over the years. But you know, going back to Red, Red, Red gave me one piece of advice. When I set up the charity back in 2013, I, I was terrified of saying a few words. People would say, just, you know, say a few words on stage. And I, I just couldn't do it. I just, I wasn't able. I, I came from a background, I suppose, like, I don't know yourself, my dad. When we were children, we were told never to speak unless you're spoken to. That was the rule. I was the same. It never yeah. worked with me. I still spoke. <laughs> But no, we didn't. We we just as an only child, I always wanted the attention. We were told never to speak unless you're spoken to. And in later years, then I had no confidence. It blew my confidence out of the water. So there was no yeah. way I could stand up in front of people and say anything. I think they are parents meant well, but uh, my, oh, dad, yeah. my dad used to always say, A lady should be seen and not heard. I know. And that was daddy's always say. Uh, 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 saying that I always remember him saying a lady should be seen and not heard <laughs> but I was even, seen even going, and through, heard. <laughs> even going through school when you had the answer and you're asked to put up the hand I, could, I just couldn't do it yeah I was that bad I was very very shy and very nervous so uh but anyway going back to the red story um <clears throat> the very first uh, fundraiser we did in Emmerich was with Red Hurley back in 2014 and that night okay, he said okay. I have to go on stage and say a few words. This is a big concert. It was himself and Brendan Grace in the lime tree. We spoke about it a yeah, couple of nights days ago. And uh, I said, right, I can't. So there's, there's 500 people there. <laughs> there's no way and get on stage. And no, I said, you know what you do? This is the advice now. Go on stage and imagine there's just one person at the front of the. That's it. You're only speaking to one person. Yeah. yeah. And Pick your lights, watch the lights above the ceiling and focus on the lights. Don't see anybody and mm -hmm. just say it from your heart. 
what what it is, what you're doing. And from that moment, then I did start saying words on stages. So yeah. I think what, the one bit of advice I have for children in my class when I had a class was one piece of advice I had for them was to go on stage and imagine that the audience is there just to look at them being yeah. fabulous. Yeah. And um and that and and that and that seems to actually work as well. It's funny, I mean, I taught speech and drama. Um, so and it was amazing the techniques you learn to actually calm people down, the breathing yeah. techniques, everything that that do work, you know, the 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 wringing of your hands, the um the shaking of your hands to get rid of the uh, words. Oh, it's an art form, there's no doubt. <clears throat> I've spoken quite, you know, over the eight years since we formed the charity. I've spoken so, so many times, but even now still, I find the smaller groups actually worse than the bigger groups. I'd have yeah. no problem standing in front of five or 600 people now, but standing in front of 20 people is a different thing. I find that even tough. So, But I wouldn't be an overconfident, I'm, I'm not a natural confident speaker anyway. Do you know, that's, that's just the way I am. But that's not what you were meant to be. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious when one meets Kevin Clancy that honesty and integrity and kindness oozes from you and and that was the one of the first things that I actually noticed I mean my very first interview I noticed how emotional you got when we talked oh, about yeah, that and you and I, you know I was kind of taken aback and I thought oh my god Kevin is going to cry and you did get I emotional did. I did and I try. thought, oh, how am I going to cope cope with this? Because I'm going to be off now in a minute because that's all I need. Yeah, um, I as mum used to say, your bladder is near your eye, mine, because I'd, I'd cry at the drop of a hat if someone was crying. Yeah, I'd have yeah. to come out in sympathy with them. But um, yeah, and, and that was the one thing, that was the one thing I remember about you, Kevin, was this, this innate sense of honesty, integrity and goodness about you? No, do you know that first interview, you see, I hadn't spoken about Claire. Claire was my sister. Um, she passed away 24 years of age with spina bifida, but I hadn't spoken about her in a long, long time. And her passing, <clears throat> we were not even close, we were massively close as kids. Yeah. And, uh, was Claire younger passed, than you? She was 24 and I would have been 15, 16. So you were younger? But we were we just we grew up together, and the fact that she had spina bifida, um, I suppose looking back, I was a main carer. You know, I gave all my my childhood with caring for Claire, yeah, and um, playing with Claire, and you know we grew up together. So when she passed, it had a devastating impact on me to to such an extent that I didn't attend funerals for nearly thirty years. I wouldn't go to one. Yeah. I just refused to go. Um, it was the first time we'd moved back from England at the time to Ireland, a little village called Dune. And uh, it was the first time I'd seen the Irish funeral where they, the, you know, the wake and round the coffin. And I just, I just couldn't. Uh, That's pretty it. spectacular, the Irish funerals. I will say that. It's no, it is. Awful. It is. And I understand how it works now, but at the time, as a sixteen-year-old, it was really hard. Um, so that, that first interview that we did, you know, it, it, I suppose all that came back. But even now, I, 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 did, I had a chat a couple of weeks ago. Don't ask me where it came from. I don't know. Because I'm not a crier. And lads here will tell you at home, I don't, I'm not a natural crier. But uh, we're talking about my dad and the way my dad passed. And just like that, I had to just get up from the interview and just come back a few minutes later. I was just... Uh, I like think sometimes a... A, a, a host uh, of anything or somebody can just hit on a yeah. nerve, can, yeah. just, can t just touch on something uh, yeah. that can actually just trigger that trigger that emotion off in you and I obviously did that that day do you know and it and I felt terrible because it it's like when I interviewed a holocaust survivor the other day from my first time interviewing anyone from Auschwitz Birkenau he didn't want to talk about it at all but yet he wanted his story told his daughter was practically crying through the whole interview oh, know, and yeah. and it, the effect was even worse in her. And I thought, I, I was thinking all the way through the interview, I've just, you know, I've just unleashed memories in these people that I really didn't want to do, but yes. they wanted to talk. 
Yeah. And all I could do was listen. And I found myself unable to even speak on a few occasions, Kevin, because Mm -hmm. I thought, because I was on the, I, 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 was on the verge of crying and that that happens but it also adds i think to the sense of humanity that connect, that that happens between a guest and a, and a host a guest yeah. host that you buy into but taking you back um kevin to the very beginning when claire um died and you decided to set up the claire's wish foundation maybe you'd like to tell uh, um how the difficulties you experienced or whether it was an easy easy process for you to get it. Set. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll jump back to uh, 1975. And my, my dad's mother passed away here in Doom. We were living in England, obviously, at the time. Um, dad had been living there since the 60s, 50s, 60s, and met, met mother at a bus stop. And long, long story anyway. Your parents are right. Irish. Uh, my dad is Irish, my mother was English. Okay. <clears throat> so he moved back to a little bit called workshop in Nottingham, right on the border of Sherwood Forest. That's mm. where we, yeah, Robin Hood territory. Robin Hood territory. Robin Hood used to visit our village, actually. But anyway, um, so uh, June 75, uh, his mother passed away here in June and he came back. Now, we used to come back every two years for a holiday here. We loved it. Just loved Couldn't wait to get back every couple of years. Funny, isn't it? So it had a massive impact on him as well. His mother's passing had a huge impact on him. Yeah. And uh, we attended the funeral. And of course, as kids, we had a great time back at, in workshop because we could kick the football around the grass at home that we weren't allowed to while he was there. So with a massive two weeks, <laughs> we, didn't, we had a great couple of weeks while he was gone. But, uh, when he came back, <laughs> I can remember uh, my sister was about to join the police force. And my, my brother was about to join the Air Force. And I had just moved into a, a fantastic secondary school in, in uh, England where we had rugby, cricket, all the sports you can imagine, boxing, everything. And he sat us down one Sunday and um, told us that he was moving back. He was selling up and moving back to doing and We were God's night. Absolutely. Oh, God's Kevin. Night. I mean, that was a huge... Um... Dune is beautiful. I've taught Irish dancing in Dune, but it and it's beautiful there. But it's a huge change from the yeah, UK. and not even the, just the, the from what we had to, to to nothing basically. There wasn't a lot in Dune. You know, it was a lovely little village, but it was. Yeah. Uh, do you play GAA? You also go into the art class. Not to, a metropolis. No, no, no. <laughs> Of course, uh, coming coming over with a Sheffield accent in them days, I mean, Birmingham was still being bombed and Manchester was still being bombed. The week we moved back, September 75, we moved back. So we weren't exactly, uh, I would say, we weren't made the most welcome there either for a while. It took me 10 years actually to settle down. Isn't that funny, Kevin? And I mean, I, I mean, you know, my dad came back in 1974 to Ireland to live. But up to then, I only saw my dad once a year. And sometimes not at all, because with foot and mouth in the 70s, he couldn't come that year. But he never felt ever that um, uh, unwelcome in Ireland when he came. And he, I mean, his father is Irish, but his, his mother wasn't. And he was born in the UK. The whole family are from the UK. Yeah. And, and they weren't Catholic. But he never felt that sense of. No, neither did we. When he we were was just looking at him because yeah. he, was, he was English. Do you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it was that tough. other people have felt. My uh, my sister didn't last two weeks in school. She moved into the convent here in in Doon. She only lasted two weeks. Gone. She had to get a job. Couldn't handle it. Um, really? I was only I was only young, so I had to stay there. But uh, it was tough. Um, so Claire. Again, Claire came from, um, you know, she had a lot of uh, spina bifida association in England was was quite large, and she she yeah. had regular trips away and stuff like that. And she came back yeah. here. There was nothing. Nothing. Here. Nothing. And did your dad ever regret um, up no, and the no. people, or did <clears> he, throat> he throat> just like my mother, so intent on getting back to Ireland. It didn't matter whether I liked it or whether anyone else liked it as long as she was back in Ireland. 
he probably felt that. And you know something, uh, looking back now, like I'm 50, 55 now, looking back, best decision he ever made. No doubt. Short term, no, we went through hell. <laughs> there's no there's no other word. We get 10 years of hell. But uh, once we got settled, once I moved out of school, I left school at 16. I suppose that's another thing with the confidence thing as well. I left school early. I did enough. I never did my leaving. I just had enough. 16 when I was able to leave. As soon as I was able to leave, I couldn't wait. But yeah. then that lack of education later on in years has certainly, you know, hasn't helped. But uh, can always go I, back. Yeah, I went. I went into work straight away, and I ended up then after a few years going into my own business for 20 years with retail. Never thought I'd do that. So I ended up really, really in a good place. So when, when we look back and see what's happened. What was when, your own business, Kevin? I was on the Parkway Shopping Centre for 20 years. Oh, that's, do you know yeah. that's right? That's you, but you were in the Parkway at the time that you were on with me. I, as far as I remember, you were. I was, I'd say, yeah. You were, yeah. you were, you had the little shop in the park. Yeah, I had 20 years there and I opened, I opened six shops actually from the parkway. The parkway was doing really well and I, I took the uh, template from the parkway and opened. Yeah. Two, three, oh, I remember, it. that's right. I remember going into you so often inside the shop and you were always so nice. No, 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 that's what what I, I asked you to come on the show inside yeah. the parkway shop. So Claire, Claire really came back to nothing again here as well. So because um, back in the 70s, and it's different now. It's totally different now. The Spanish Association is pretty strong here now. But back in the 70s, it, it wasn't. So she gave most of her childhood in the bedroom. Did she have hydrocephalus as well? In hydrocephalus. So she used to have, no, we, we were used to looking at it, but she used to have massive, uh, what we call fits. Yeah. And... Uh, the fits would literally knock her out for she'd be out for five or six hours just gone and uh so but i was used to that you know it, it didn't mean a lot we were, we were so used to looking at that that uh but the thing about claire was then when we moved back and i don't know how it started but for some reason she took a massive shine to red hurley and a, a bedroom it's, post it's understandable bedroom. he's a lovely guy i don't know how it started originally but she collected records and she collected because the records are big in those days but posts literally from one wall of a bedroom to the other and she always had this wish at some stage to visit one of her uh, red's concerts but of course back in the 70s you're talking of uh you know the uh the places like Dundrum, oyster ballroom in Drumkeen, they were packed from door to door you couldn't walk in with a wheelchair certainly not it? wheelchair access no but we, what we did one night, we took her to the, uh, the Dundrum in the County Tipperary, if you remember the old hall that was there. I can't think of the name of the hall there. Was now. Red was playing there. And they met us after the show. Now, we thought we'd be just in and out in five minutes. And himself and Liam literally sat down with Claire for two solid hours after the show. I'll never forget it. That's it lovely. It's in my head all through my life what he did for that night. But you know, his, co his sister is a colleague of mine in Irish dancing, uh, uh, Olive, and she's an absolute lady. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it's clear that it's in the family, do you know, that they are yeah. that way anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's so important, I suppose, as an entertainer, you look at Daniel O'Donnell and that, and you know the reason he is so highly successful is he, he just doesn't leave the minute the show is over. No, correct. He's and there for his point. he's there for his fans. He yeah. as long as they're they're happy, he's happy. And you know, it pays off in the long run. And I've been to a lot of shows now over the last eight, nine years with Red. You know, we've, we've been in contact probably five or six times every during the year, you know. And uh he can't wait the minute the last song is is played, you can see Red disappears, and you know he's gone to the front front of the house to meet people. Um and you know, he's not, I, a, 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 you know, I was struck by the fact that he is quite a reserved um, man. He's quite, he's not uh, overly, um, uh, uh, he's quite shy, I yeah. would say. And, and but yet um, loves to talk to people once he, once he, once he feels comfortable. Oh uh, yeah, he loves, he yeah. loves his fans, there's no doubt about that. And a lot of the modern stars, I actually worked in University Concert Hall for, for a short while, a couple of years ago, and I noticed that a lot of the new stars now, they just can't wait to get off stage into the car and they're gone. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate because um, it does mean a lot to the fans and a lot, a lot, some quite a lot of the wish requests that we get are to meet um, stars, you know. So if you're a big fan, say, of Rod Stewart and you've been to four or five of his concerts throughout the last 15 years and, you know, you've been... I am. I am. Yeah, yeah. I've been to his concert in in in, in Coleman Park. We were, con we were contacted by a family that had a lady that had been to a lot of his concert and she'd been given some bad news and all she wanted was just to meet him and say hello to him. And we were able to do that for her, you know? It's such a great... I mean, what I was impressed with him was the fact that he came out, he started talking, then the, he looked at... He stopped and he said, oh, shut up, Rod, and just sing. <laughs> He's a genuine guy, isn't he? You know, yeah. just shut up, Rod, and sing. <laughs> I, I, I oh, thought yeah. that was very funny. And he, and he sang then for the entire time and very little talk, just singing, which is what people uh, yeah. came for. Absolutely. Uh, but, um, but you So, yeah, Claire, Claire, pa Claire passed away in, um, in, in, in 85, on 27th of January, 1985, she passed away. And you know what? It was always in the back of my head over the years, even when I got busy in retail, that it was something I needed to revisit. So I didn't know how or what I was going to do. Yeah. It was always in the back of my head that I need to revisit it, Claire, some stage. And I had no idea how. And little did I think, my dad got sick in uh, 2011, in January very small, he had two gallstones. He went into the region with two small gallstones. He went yellow. And they got one out fairly quickly, but the second one, there's a procedure. They send a little basket down to get the gallstone, but the downside is that you can get an infection, and the, the infection can go into your pancreas. And that's exactly what happened. And he gave probably four or five weeks in the regional until he was, we didn't realise how bad he was, actually. He was... Uh, transported to the intensive care unit in a matter hospital and he gave apart from three days he gave the whole six months on a ventilator now unless you've seen somebody i know we're going through covid now at the minute and you know part of the covid procedure is the ventilator mm. it's it's the horrors it's literally head back yeah it's, have and you then ever it can seen the voice box afterwards when it, people have I, the, the tube taken out because the muscle has the muscle has tightened up, and he, he he was he was laid back in intensive care unit for six months, strapped to that thing, and we were going up and down uh, twice a week, Jesus. and it was going no there was no progress. The only one time he came out for three days, we thought he was picking up. And the actual doctor said to us, uh, don't, don't have too many hopes. It's not as good as it looks. And he was dead right. Three days later, he was gone back into intensive care. But he spoke once and he had a wish. This is how the whole thing started now. And his wish was, would you ever unplug me out of this stuff and take me back on to doing? But you, we couldn't take the chance. We couldn't take the chance of doing it. And as it turned out, after the six months, it was... It was actually on his mother's anniversary day that he died, which is ironic. Uh, and he never got home. If he'd have known that, he'd have had a laugh about that. <laughs> he never got home, no. But when when they actually finally unplugged him from the incident here, from all the stuff he was on, he was gone within 30 seconds. Uh, not did again. they know that was going to happen? Oh, they did, yeah. Did they know that once they unplugged him, he was going to die? The infection went into his pancreas and completely mushed in, turned into a sponge, basically. Your pancreas is, we had to come back and Google what is a pancreas. Horrific, isn't it, Kevin? Watching, um, watching somebody um, you love. Awesome. Yeah. Who, who's so vibrant and so full of life disintegrate before your eyes and you can do absolutely nothing about it. An ex ambulance driver in the regional himself. Yeah. I mean, it's just. I watched it with my own mother and it was just impossible to imagine um, because she was diagnosed within four or five days of my dad's death, sudden death. And she just went downhill from there. It was like yeah. as if this strong, powerful, the woman who was always the rock in the family yeah. just suddenly said, I don't want to live anymore. 
Yeah, so sad. So he passed away on his mother's anniversary in June 2011. And we spent the next 18 months sorting mother out. Obviously, mother was left on her own. And I moved her over to my own house. She bought a smashing mobile home and I built it into the back garden. And I gave the following couple of years uh, building pathways up to the up to the mobile and building a bit of a garden and ramps and, you know, getting the sorted out. And so it was a granny house. Yeah, and it's, it's still okay. here, actually. It's still here. But um, so from that point, once, once we got settled then, I kind of revisited the wish thing Dad had. And I just went into Google one night and searched. There must be somebody in Ireland granting wishes for adults. And I was shocked. There weren't. There were none. Anybody, there wasn't. Went into the UK to see who was in the UK, and there was three or four. Went back here onto Google, nobody. Um, the only charities here in Ireland were uh, granting, there was two granting wishes for uh, children, and they stopped at 17. And I immediately thought, well, that can't be right. That, that, that needs to be looked at. So I started thinking, only just thinking about, will, will we set up a charity? There's a lot of work in setting a charity up. I and can imagine. There is, it's worse so probably now than even when, when I did it um, eight years ago. But um, so what happened next was my, my wife works in Palace Green nursing home. And she heard of a story of a local girl trying to get married in the area. And she came back and said it to me, if you're thinking of granting a wish, you know, if you're thinking of setting up a charity for wishes, once after coming up in, in Palace Green, would you take a look at it? I said, absolutely. Now we want set up, this is August, 2013. Yeah, and we got on board. Now, as it happened, I, I have a small bit of a past and uh, used to drive wedding cars for Irish Diamond Limousines in Raheen. So my phone was full of wedding contacts, which was great. I just rang a load of people and see could we get the wish, you know, granted basically for this lady. She's only 24. Yeah, and she had uh, cancer at the back of her tongue. Very unusual. That I've come across it maybe once in the last eight years. It's very Where? rare on the tongue. Yeah, that's when my grandmother had it. Very, very rare. And my mother had it in the throat. So we uh, got involved anyway, and she got married in August uh, 2013. So from that point on, then I thought, that's it. We're going to set up the foundation. And we uh, got onto our accountants, got the CHY number all set up, and we launched it in um, October 2000, just a few months later. October 2013. It's not easy, Kevin. It's not easy to get, you know, I know it's not a business, it's a, a non-profit and it's charity, but it's not easy getting anything off the ground in this country. No. The red tape, the, yeah. the, 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 the loops you've got to jump through to get anything started. I Probably wonder if anybody starts a business or starts a charity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Harder now, I would say, even back in eight years ago. But uh, of course, the name, you know, the name Claire's Wish Foundation, where did that come from? Well, as I was saying earlier on, there was no brainer for me because I was waiting in the wings for what am I going to do with Claire's name? <laughs> so, <laughs> and what an honour, what an honour it was to call a charity after Claire. She'd have laughed because she was a bold, she had a bold sense of humour as well. So she would have found it very amusing. But, uh, so yeah, so we're we're the only charity now in Ireland granting wishes for adults of eternal illness, named after my sister. So it must how, make you feel very proud. Oh, and, absolutely. And you know, and, and you know, charities have got, I suppose, charities have got a bit of a bashing lately. Yeah. Um, as some charities, and and you, how do you cope with with, with with that situation, Kevin? How do you cope with the negativity to, that that's there towards uh, well, some, some charity? Not not so much the negativity, but the 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 concern that's there. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Yeah, no, and it, it does it affects um, people's attitude to fundraising. Well, do you know, the, I've I've always since I started the charity. Number one, I've always had this thing. Don't be looking at others. Do your own thing. I've always done my own thing, yeah. and I always will do. And that, I suppose, Claire's wishes is on a scale that I'll always ever see it at. It's that we're only a small charity. We do what we can do with what we have, and that that's all I ever see Claire's wish being. And it's all I want it to be really. I don't want it to be a massive national charity or like that. So we we just do our just own want thing. Just want to have your own, own way, own but... contribution to remembering Claire. 
Yeah, uh, it's a very personal charity for me. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, every time I grant a wish, we I do so, you know, for Claire and for it's a real personal charity, you know. So. And you know, um, I, my show here supports the Samaritans, uh, uh, Limerick and Tipperary. And the reason I support as well, the charity is like your charity. It's small. It's 100% uh, sponsored and supported by, by yeah. donations. It gets yeah. nothing at all from the government. Um, yeah. It's been there since the very beginning. It's the first suicide awareness charity there is. Um, and it's been there for, forever. And they get nothing, um, only if, like you, from what you can, you can get from support from the, pub, the general public. And from day one, we started the charity. I was always um, aware that we do events. We Most of the fundraisers we do, we do it ourselves. We do events. But I'm always aware to do an event that people want to come and see, like a concert. Yeah. Try and do an event like a concert that people will come to it. And by the way, it's it's in Ada Clare's Wish Foundation. So yeah. they're, not, they're, they're coming to see, like the Red Hurley concert, for example. Um, we get a lot of support for the Red Hurley concert every yeah. year. Yeah, of course you would. You know, people he's, so maybe Red. even his interview with me the yeah. other day, the amount of people who've watched his interview is yeah. astonishing. Because yeah. it shows, so, tells you how many people, people have watched. come to see the Red Hurley concert. And by the way, it's an aid of Claire's Wish Red Foundation. Foundation. You know, most, of, most of them wouldn't even know who Claire's Wish Foundation probably until I get up and say a few words, you know. Uh, the other thing I'm, I'm very aware of too is, and it was in, I think it was the first year we did a church gate collection. Yeah. And I said, never again would I do a church gate collection. I felt so, I just didn't feel right about it. So I've made, I've made. Why, a, why ever not? Because I'm anti buckets. And it, I yeah. know it goes against my charity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree a hundred. Yeah, I, I, agree. I can quite easily take a van to Galway and do a three-day event in Galway with buckets and raise whatever. I'm yeah. not. It's not me. Yeah. I felt so guilty. Stood outside the church taking two two euros off of somebody. Yeah, it yeah, just, yeah. It wasn't me, and I wasn't. I made. I made a promise from that point on. I would never do, and I haven't. I've never gone out on the street with a bucket. And I've never yeah. done a church gate collection or anything to do with buckets. I won't do them. Uh, I'll only do events. But events. you you organised an event that I, I I attended as well out in Thomond Park. It was uh, what is her name, Catherine? Catherine Fulvio. Fulvio. I was there yeah. thinking it's a poet. <laughs> I knew it was. Do you know Catherine's a poet was the minister for children. I knew there was something wrong there, and uh, <laughs> but I was there thinking Catherine something or other. Oh, my brain was going around. Okay. It was the first big event actually. It's that Italian one. name, and I was thinking of Ful uh, Zapone, <laughs> but no Fulvio, and it was very good. I yeah. can't. I. I. I uh, you know, I'm not a domestic a domestic goddess or anything like that. I'm not even into domesticity, but I uh, I enjoyed it greatly. And yeah. and I could imagine for a few minutes I was this wonderful cook. I went with my friend, who's an absolute food uh, cook. Uh, she a cooking fanatic. So. Yeah, she, so now here's the thing back to yourself. Now, did you go to see Catherine or did you go for Casa Claire's Wish Foundation? I went because of Claire's Wish Foundation. Oh, did you? No, yeah. that's. It's, I try and I try and, I'm, and do. I'm genuinely saying that because I mean, yeah. anyone who knows me knows I wouldn't be going to watch a cook, um, uh, because I'm not. Um, I'm your typical only child whose mother never wanted anyone in the kitchen, only her. <laughs> that suited me just beautifully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Were handed up. Hence, after she died, I wasn't ever even inclined to. I like baking. Um, but I don't really like cooking because the food just, I like it to look nice. Yeah, yeah. And, and we had a Never Maguire event as well. We did a Never Maguire event a couple of years later. That was very popular as well. So we try and do, I try and do, well, usually, obviously now it's different, but uh, we try and do events that people will come to see, whoever it is. And by the way, you know, I think it's nicer to do it that way, fundraising. Yeah. I'm very aware of fundraising. I'm very aware of I know it's an awful thing to say. I don't want to become a greedy charity. I know it's a statement that you mightn't. 
kind of like an oxymoron in the sense that, you know, if it's not, if you don't keep going out there trying to raise funds, the charity dies off and, 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 and then yeah. automatically the people that you're, try, that you're hoping will benefit from the charity yeah. lose out. But yeah. at the same time, you don't want to appear as, I, I can understand greedy as well, but I don't think, Kevin, I don't think anybody would think you were being greedy. Oh, no, 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 no. And that's the point we try not to. That's what I'm saying. We don't, why we don't do the buckets. Do you know, you're understand? doing, you're doing, you're, you're, you're not only collecting for a charity, um, but you're also making life that little bit easier for people yeah. at end of life. So normally during the year, we would do probably 12 of our own events to keep the funds going. Now, obviously, uh, COVID hit last March and that just, with all of charities out there, it, it's uh, been devastating because uh, the normal events that we obviously could do, we, we can no longer, longer do. So we're trying to, uh, you know, do things online now at the moment, come up with different ideas online. The only good thing we did is we, we tightened up everything last March and anything that was outstanding, we got rid of. In other words, if we, uh, we had a Claire's Wish volunteer's car that we used to use going from events to events, carrying all the banners like this, Ron with his, you know, you need cars for volunteers with seven seater. Sold that immediately because we could just see that sat for 12 months or whatever. Good job we did because it would have been sat. Uh, we sold that and put the funds back into the account and basically froze our account straight away to try and keep things uh, tight. And it's worked, it's worked pretty well. So any fundraising that, and we only had two fundraisers last year online um, rather than the normal 12. But the two were, I don't know, you, you could run uh, what seems to be popular now are quizzes. Um, you could run online quizzes or you could run online um, uh, bingo um, mm. nights. I've never been to bingo in my life. And Kevin, I won't be attending. I, I'd send you the money rather than attend it because I just, I, my concentration would be just... We never, I, I wouldn't even know how to do bingo. I've never, I never in my life even had an inclination to go to bingo, but I'd send you the money. But, um, but so, that's so, very popular, yeah, yeah. So, some of, some of the wishes that we do grant, we, we try and, and we in the eight years that we have uh operated, we try and grant a wish every four weeks, and that's our been our uh, do you know what uh, you could do as well, Kevin? Would be to have a kind of a um. Uh, a talent competition where you could get people to send in. I know we're doing it with the Irish dancing, with the um, fashion and that um, children dance. They they do they dance. They have have their music. They they video it. Then it's sent, and over a period of three days, it's judged by six judges or whatever. You could do the same, and you could get people to enter at. Uh, um, uh, a competition, a singing competition, send yeah. in themselves singing yeah. and have read or somebody or a few more people um, uh, judging it over, uh, over, over a period of time. They have to yeah. pay so much to, to actually enter the competition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that, you know, there, there's all different ways you can, I'm sure you can, I'm sure you have loads of people to to give you advice, but um, how do you have many volunteers now, Kevin? Uh, we usually work with uh, UL pretty well because our office is based just around the corner from UL. So we've had uh, the PVA program volunteers normally um, and co-op placements as well. So normally we would have quite a few. At the moment, no, we don't. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm wrong there. We actually have a few online from the PVA program in UL about five working on different ideas at the moment. So UL is great for that. UL is fantastic. You must feel now at, at the moment, you know, you, everything is just, it's almost like we're in house arrest at the moment yeah, because, yeah. and without any, at least, at least if you were in prison, you'd be told, well, your, your um, release date is at a certain time, but the, the goalpost keeps getting moved. Um, now the most the most amazing thing for us last year actually was that we were we were granting wishes during the year, which was amazing because you grant, granted we were, grant, we were still granting wishes last year. Isn't that in between good? lockdowns, we were sending people away for a couple of nights in hotels, even and the, the hotels were opening and closing and opening and lockdown, and we still managed to grant wishes last year, which was just 
I don't know how we did it, how we achieved it, but we did. We're still still granting much last year through it all. And, and tell me um, what the process, Kevin, would be. Somebody comes and tells you that somebody needs um, or is somebody is dying or somebody is, have they to be end of life um, or, or, you know, or have they to be terminal? You have to have a medical terminal illness. And uh, the normal process is, is exactly what I did a few years ago. Go on to Google, see who, who's out there granting wishes for adults and we're, we're the only one. So we'll, we'll come up straight away. We're, we're pretty easy to find. Uh, we have an excellent website. So people will, will go onto our website. They'll either leave a message on the website or they'll send us an email directly. Uh, we do have a wish application form that has to be verified by the doctor. He stamps the, uh, the, there's a page for a doctor to fill out as well. Now, it all depends though, if, if we get a particular wish request stating a particular illness, <coughs> one that comes up is pancreatic cancer. If we see that there's no forms, as I know, I know pancreatic cancer is really, really, um, or liver cancer is pretty bad. And you don't want to get people involved in filling out forms. So there is particular, um, it depends what the wish is and what the, the uh, condition is. Um, those particular two stand out immediately that we will just drop everything because we know from past, we, we, we send people on a weekend on a Sunday with pancreatic cancer and by Tuesday they're gone. You know, so... We, there's no forms and any requests we get from Milford, which we do get on a regular basis. We don't ent entertain forms from Milford either. Um, there's no need. Uh, but the normal process would be through email and the wish application form then. As soon as that comes back, then we'd start working on the wish immediately. Now, some of the wishes are, do you know what, the breaks away just to get away from a weekend somewhere. Um, do you know, because it's, it's, it's not even about where they're going to, it's it's creating memories for the family. And it's taking the last picture probably together as a family in that hotel. Um, some of the wishes places we've gone to are Foldo, uh, Tato Park, Dublin Zoo, National Stud, Disneyland Paris, um, Legoland, you know, places like that. Other wishes we get could be, I'd love to have a wish of a helicopter flying over my house. We've had a couple of those. Actually, there's one there. I did it in front of me. Bernard or Dublin. Can you see that? Yep. Can you see that one? Yep. Look up to. Wow. Bernard's wish was, um, and he had insurance problem. No helicopter company would, would go near this wish because uh, of his condition. So we actually got involved with, uh, he's from, well, he, he's passed away a few weeks ago, actually, uh, Bernard. But, um, we got in contact with the Cork, he's from Cork um, and Douglas area, and we got in contact with the Fort, for, uh, Cork Fire Brigade to see could they lift him in and out of the helicopter and take away that problem. And we did, we, we got that wish granted. Actually, do you know something? I know you're, in, are you into poetry? You are smart. Yeah. You? Bernard Rock. I'm afraid so. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a dead romantic. <laughs> this guy, this is what wishes me to somebody. Bernard wrote a smashing poem. It's there now. Right. Oh. I'm just going to read. Let me read it for two seconds. And this this is what a wish granted means because I, I can't. Your show, people, Kevin. People ask me, what do wish grant, granted what mean to the brand, yeah. mean to the person? Yeah. You, you, have to, you have to read some of the testimonials on our board here to see what it, exactly what it means to people. But th this is a poem that Bernard wrote, right? <clears throat> and he called it a wish come true. Claire's light, star bright, your star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might have the wish I wish tonight. Above the world so high, today I'm an eagle in the sky. I'm flapping with my feelings. I'm feeling weightless. I feel new, I feel alive, I feel free. I feel whole, I feel invincible and strong. I feel humbled and inspired. I feel grateful, I feel a matter. I feel amazing, I feel so happy. I feel deep and deep joy. Rotary blades are wine impossibilities, life endless before me. I feel transformed. You asked me why, you gave me wings. I touched the sky. Claire's light, star bright, your star, or oh, what a sight. 
I wish I made, I wish a flight. I got that wish I made that night with deepest gratitude, Bernard O'Dunham. You couldn't put that into words, could you? You couldn't put that into words. It's just, it's just, um, it's just unimaginable, really. And, you know, uh, what strikes me from it is that when we are coming to at the ends of our lives, really, I suppose it's very little that we, that people actually want. Yeah. It's not not the grandiose um, uh, things, the, the the car, the the uh, the jewelry. The I'm obsessed with jewelry, and you know, and not really cars or anything like that. But end of life when what it's the little things that people look for and you know you hear that saying all the time when you fight with somebody when you have an argument with somebody and you say is this what i'm going to be thinking of in my deathbed this row um and 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 and, and you realize that if it's not then it's not important to be holding on to that argument uh, yeah. if it's not the last thing you're going to be thinking of before you leave this earth is it worth holding on to and you know, such a simple request to just go up in a helicopter. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, a lot, you, you know, you, we get breaks away to uh, Killarney or Kilkenny. It's, it's not about the break at all. It, it's getting the family together for one last time. That's all it is. That's what wish granting is. You and send it, and you know, you're sending the family away for the last time. And, and do you know some, something? <sighs> When somebody is dying that's so close to you, and I know you've no, known it with your father, but most especially Claire, yeah, you really don't think. And um, it's when you, when I hear things like this with you, Kevin, I think to myself, my God, should I have, could I have, you know, done something like that for my own mother? My dad's greatest wish was to see Hawaii. He never told anybody except yeah. my mother. And I only found out after he had died uh, um, that all he ever wanted was to see Hawaii. And wasn't and that doable? It was so doable. And, and I always said, if I ever got the opportunity to go there, I'd bring a picture of him and leave it somewhere really, really beautiful, that it would be forever there, untouched, and that he'd be he'd be part of that scenery for the re for the rest of eternity in um, in some respects. Now, you know, I, I don't know whether it was looking back on it now. I think it was because I'm not sure whether it was because of Hawaii Five O series that used to be on TV because he was always watching that as a child. When I was growing up, I'd be conscious. My dad would always be watching Steve yeah. McGarrett and Hawaii Five O. Or was his love of Hawaii Five O because of his dream of seeing Hawaii, and he never did. And yes, I know. And some of the wish requests, you know, they can be, they can be unusual ones. Like I remember one particular one. Now we sent them to Tato Park because the wish came from the mom who was who was terminally ill, and the wish was to put a smile back on my children's face again. That was the wish. How amazing is that? So we thought, well, how, how can we do that? And the best place to do that is Tato Park. And we, we got a, a local girl there to take professional photographs of the family. I have it here right in front of me, actually, one of them on the board. And the smiles that came back from the kids that day were just... There's, there's one particular one where the youngest daughter, the two of them smiling together. Actually, you can see, one second. Yeah. It's funny, but I have it in here. It's right in the board there. If you don't need to see that. Yep. Look at the smile of that. <laughs> That's what it's about. You can't, you can't uh, replicate that. You, you and another, another one that stands out, that stands out always to me, was um, at Milford Contact. They had a, a, a guy from Brazil living in Ireland for quite a while, and his funds were, were pretty bad, but he was in a bad way in Milford. And the wish was from his daughter who was in Portugal. The wish was to hug my dad one last time. And of course, I thought of my own dad. I thought, well, that we have to do that no matter where she is in the world. Her, her brother was in Brazil. 
we got her over within 24 hours. She'd arrived in Castle Troy and I picked her up in uh, the Hurlers Cross where the bus stops there and dropped her around to Milford at five o'clock that evening. She hugged her dad and he passed away four hours later as if he was waiting for it to come in. I mean, there's no, no matter what, if he never granted another wish ever again, that one stands out. Uh, we got the son over within 24 hours later from Brazil into Ireland and he attended the funeral that weekend. Um, but that's why these two, the two like that stand out. They're amazing, you know, to do that is amazing. Have you ever, have you ever, to be sorry? honest. What? I'm amazed at times, to be honest. I'm amazed at what we do. I'm amazed at what you do, Kevin. Uh, what started off from a small, from a seedling um, a, a, of a concept. Yeah. Um, to, I mean, everyone in Ireland, anyone in Ireland that you will ask will know Claire's Wish Foundation. Um, and, and it started off just because of the death of, of one young girl, young woman. Correct, that's it, yeah. And, you know, and the love of her brother. Yeah, I know, thanks. No, no but it's, it, it, it's true, Kevin. I mean, there's many a person has died whose family loved them, but never, ha never had the temerity or the, um, the drive to start um, a foundation in their memory. Yeah, um, and you know something when, when you, you get, do think get... Of it, but we never, you know, doing, thinking and doing, making it materialize. There's, yeah. there's, there's an enormous drive in somebody like you who can actually bring it. I know from running dance competitions and that, and, yeah. and, and, and organizing charity events um, that I've done. Um, and yes, you know, that in itself, but to organize um, uh, a, a, a full-time, if you like, to, to full-time commit yourself to making the lives of other people better is something that should be honored. And you know, you are, in my view, and I don't say it lightly, you are a national treasure because people, you know, who, who can actually step out of their, 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 own, their own selves to, to, to put all their focus on others is a very special trait. Yeah, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes we've no idea, like, uh, until we get feedback, like Bernard's point there, of just what we have actually achieved, we've no idea until we see the feedback, which is incredible. Some of the feedback is incredible. Can I just ask some of your listeners, if they don't mind, we've got a yep. lovely website, we've got two great girls, Maxine and Neve, uh, that are updating our website, it's fantastic. There are some amazing wish videos, and if you have 10 minutes, go onto our website. Um, www.clareswishfoundation.com, no, no apostrophe in Claire's. It's just right. straight Claire's Wish Foundation. And, uh, some amazing videos. Bernard's video, the, the helicopter there one, is an amazing video. I'll never forget the first time I switched it on. I actually cried at it when I saw it. Just uh, absolutely amazing. Car for um, the force with you, Kevin. Crying. It's not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a crier. This I'm just the... lucky. I'm just lucky I don't wear makeup because I'm <laughs> thinking here to myself, my eye, the, 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 the mascara, if I wore mascara, it would be down my face now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Sorry, man. I didn't mean to do that to you. No, it's okay. It's just I just keep thinking of my. And you know, do you know? Can I tell you one little story before I go? Just yeah. if you want to go onto our website and follow us on Facebook and all the usual social media, but we we were actually involved in the Tesco community funds. You know the little blue tokens you do when you're shopping, and it's it's something that's stuck in the back of my mind. We we were involved in uh, Tesco and Thurless. And I went in, you, you have to, in them days, you have to go, you can't do it now at the moment, obviously the corona, but you, you go in and you take the picture and you collect your check from the community funds and uh, they bring you up and have a cup of tea. And I have this wish book that all my wishes are inside this book physically that people can see what we do as well. And I, I had that with me as it happened on the day. And I sat down with, with uh, a lady manager there showing the wishes 
And I was only gone until quarter way through the book. And the next thing, she just got up from the table, uh, absolutely flooded in 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 tears. Mm. And uh, now I I wouldn't have done it to her. I didn't realise nobody had said it to me. But it it turned out her father had passed two weeks before that, and it just brought the whole thing. Yeah, back. with me uh, when you were talking about um, hugging her, hug, hugging her father one last time. You know, it's there isn't a person in the world I don't think that's been touched. There isn't a person in the world that hasn't been touched by grief. And, you know, when you listen to a poem like that or you, you hear the story of a girl just wanting one more hug, simple request, one more hug with your dad before he goes. It's um, not it's back to what I keep saying that. When you're faced with 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 the death of the most precious people in your life, you you'll accept any you will just the smallest of things mean so much. I know she will remember that moment for the rest of her life. There's no doubt about that. It's a life-changing moment for her. There's no doubt about that. So where do you hope Claire's wish will go from here now, Kevin? I, I mean, what well, one would hope, well, one would have hoped that COVID would have been ended by now and that we'd be back. But according to our Taoiseach, it's going to go on until the 5th of April. Yeah, um, personally, uh, personally I think it is, is wiped out, to be honest. Uh, we, we continue to do things online. We, we have, we're working on five or six ideas at the moment to raise funds and awareness is the big thing. Just let people know that we're out there. Do you know what, Mary, it's not always about funds. It's about awareness as well, just letting people know that we're there. You know, that's the main thing. And if people need help, we're there. Just contact us on our email to our face uh, through our website. Um, so if anybody needs any help, that's the main thing. Uh, yeah. Funds come second. It's help first. That's Your wife the... must be incredibly proud of you, Kevin. She is. She is. She mightn't say it all the time because, we, to be honest, we've took a lot of personal... It's, 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 it's not just like you were saying earlier on, a commitment to run the charity. It's been a massive personal commitment from my point of view. Like, I can't go out now and buy myself a nice, uh, let's just say... A, a smashing brand new BMW. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, you can't be seen. I wouldn't do it anyway. I'm very conscious of what I never do. thought about that. Kevin no. rocking, Kevin rocking what? up to his local, uh, his local dealership to buy uh, himself uh, the new, a new Maserati, Maserati. Is that what it's called? Or a, or a, yeah, or a, a knee type of, jag or something like that. People no, no, can't be done. And I'm, I'm very yeah. aware that I am, I am the founder of a charity, and it has to be. Uh, it has to be everything room. above board. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Very transparent. But it does mean that I do take personal knocks. Yeah, it is very hard to be the founder of a charity because you have to take personal knocks and uh, you have to be aware all the time of what, what, what position you're holding. Not, And I'm quite proud. I'm more than proud. I, I can see what I'm doing here. And so... But it and, is. And, and and make sure all the uh, and you have to make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. It would probably make you completely paranoid and completely obsessive. But Kevin, I I've known you for is it eight years now? Yeah. Um, thereabouts and um, the very first interview, Mary. <laughs> your very first interview, and I can honestly say there's you, you're you're one person, and I've said it at this the outset of this interview. You ooze kindness you ooze honor and 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 integrity and um and it's a small charity it deserves um it deserves financial support and if you can keep it small but keep keep yeah. you know, keep 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 the soul of it there because that's that's very important, very claire's, important. Wish, claire's wish foundation to me always comes across as being a family, uh, 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 a small family um, uh, organization that's there and at its very heart wants to do good for others. Yeah, and you know, like going back to my dad's story, when I see wish requests coming through, I know, ex I, I feel what the family are going through. You know, um, I have a personal touch with the family. Um, we stay in contact with 
family members after the wish has been granted. Um, it, it's a very, very personal thing for me. It's a personal charity. It's a family charity, like you said. It's a personal um, charity. And not just your immediate family, but everyone that you have granted those wishes to, their yeah. families and their friends have all, I suppose, in some respects become this, you've made a village out of, out of a city or uh, you've made a global village or even an Irish village by just, you know, helping the, uh, group of people. You, you yeah. turn them all into family. I agree with you. Perfect. Yeah, and that's what and that's what it should be about. Um, just um, connecting with people and trying to trying to step outside yourself for a while to to think of others at the end of life. And going back to the when we launched the charity, uh, one of the first things I did was meet Red Hurley. I went up to Dublin. He mentioned the other day, drove to Dublin and met him. And we'd met over the years anyway, so he, he was quite familiar who I was. And told him that we're setting up the charity in, in honour of Claire and asked him would he become patron for the charity, which he did. He's been patron for it the last eight years. Uh, he does a fundraiser normally every year in the Redemptorist Church in Limerick. Fantastic venue down there. Oh, and, it's been magnificent, the Redemptorist. Yeah. And I sometimes, know. sometimes I'm trying to reach out to uh, celebrities, you know, um, but I have to say, there's no place like St. John's Cathedral, no, my parish no. church. I'm very, very, you know, and when Red was talking about the uh, uh, the Redemptorist, and, uh, you know, it's spectacular. I go there all every for the novena every year. But to me, you know, I always said, if I was ever getting married, I'd have to be married in St. John's Cathedral. We that might not. There are, might, and if the doors were closed, I'd my second choice would be Notre Dame. <laughs> I have grand ideas, Kevin. <laughs> might see to get ready to do a concert there then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would, uh, yeah, jeepers. You'd want to actually um, start sculpting him now for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, you know something, Red's been great. He's been on board for the last eight years and as a patron and he's been really good for reaching out because Red has lots of contacts within the music industry, obviously. And uh, we've had one or two wish requests to meet different people or, or maybe get a voicemail or phone call or whatever from, yeah. from them. Red's helped us with quite a few in the past. Tom Jones actually was one of remember, couldn't get through to Tom. And uh, as it happened, oh, Red had Tom Jones, a green, yeah, yeah. you know, my aunt, when she died in England, in Wales, uh, she went home to uh, to Wales for a few years, for the last few years. Well, she was, you know, she was always sick from the, from her, all her life, she only had a half quarter or a half a lung um, because she had the female version of coal miners disease. She grew up in Wales, in Pontypridd, and uh, she always wanted to move back to Wales, so they moved back. And when she died, she was she was in a little church, tiny little church. I'd say ten people, ten of us fitted into it, a Pentecostal church up in the mountains in Wales. And as her coffin was coming in, they, they sang the green, green grass of home. Oh, yeah, lovely. Because she absolutely adored Tom Jones. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, And so do I. But uh, it's it's the Welsh blood. You have to. I can't. I contacted Red and said, "Look, I'm having a problem. Would you know anybody?" He says, "I would, of course." But in an hour, he had a number. Do you know what I mean? That's the way he's been so good to us now. He's and really you never good. got on to. You never got through to Tom. Oh, we did, yeah. Oh, you did. Oh, we did, yeah. Wow, I'll have to get that number from you, Kevin. <laughs> we've um, we've granted wishes. For, we've granted wishes for uh, Brian Adams, Niall Horan. Lionel Richie, Rod Stewart, Spandau Ballet. So we've got through to quite a few of the... Lionel Richie was probably the biggest one now, but um, it's amazing Kevin, how... Kevin, I'll be on the blower to you trying to get <laughs> to them on the show. <laughs> we have your last wish lined up, Mary. <laughs> I, think I, might, I, have, I think I may have somebody really, 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 really... Um, my dream uh, ho uh, guest... Um, uh, from the arts. Um, I won't say who it is because I'm afraid it won't materialize, but um, I hope I get him because he's been my favorite dancer of all times. And if I get him, I'll die happy. 
<laughs> so you know, I'm just. Um, but Kevin, thank you very, very thank you much. Thank you very much, Mary. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was an honor really to be on. Pleasure. Thanks a million. God bless, Kevin. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care.